yes, that's right, seniors. We are here uh, for your last chapel in Casa de Ellis. Um, super excited to have you guys here. Just wanted to check to my left to make sure that this was live, and I think it is live. So we're good to go. Um, this is kind of one of those chapels, if I'm being honest with you, uh, is really hard. Um, this being the last chapel of the year for our seniors before you're done with classes. Now, of course, you're invited back next week. We're going to do chapel again next week. Uh, we totally invite you and want you to stay connected. And hey, before I move on, there's a couple things that you can do as seniors or really anybody watching this to stay connected to the content that we're putting out kind of student ministries wise right now. Uh, first one is this. Uh, you are most likely, I'm almost 100% positive, you're watching this on YouTube. If you would subscribe to this channel, that would alert you when we go live, but that would also alert you, I believe, you can set it to alert you when we put new content up. And I also want to let you know something else that we've been doing. I know a couple of you know about this, but we've got a Briarcrest Christian School Student Ministries podcast. Yes, that's a long name for something that is awesome. And we are about to, later this week, go live with our latest episode with the Matt Schroeder. So Schroeder and I, uh, we talked for a couple minutes. He updated us on life. Uh, class of 2020 he had a little something special he wanted to say to you. Uh, and so if you look what I believe is probably below the screen you're watching now, you can see all the links to subscribe to that podcast. So if you subscribe, you won't have to miss an episode including the Matt Schroeder. Um, so excited that he was willing to join us. So as we kind of transition into today, I want to share with you why this, this chapel in particular every year, and especially this year, is one of the more difficult ones. And I mean difficult like in a good and bad way. Uh, there's a there's kind of a theological term I've used uh, or heard used rather, which is gospel goodbyes. And for our senior class, this feels like a gospel goodbye. And I think what makes this more difficult than normal is that this is not normal. I'm literally in my game room right now. There is a frozen castle just off camera right here. Like that's not the way we normally end our chapel schedule for the year, but yet here we are. And so it's been more difficult in that way because this doesn't feel normal, but I also want to say something to the say something to the class of 2020. And I'm hoping I get to elaborate on this in the future pretty soon. But class of 2020, you guys have been such an encouragement to me. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that in a little while, but you've been such an encouragement to me. Uh, we were talking one day in one of my apologetics classes and somebody was just kind of like, hey, encourage me. Like what's what, 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 why do we need to keep pushing forward right now? You know, I just feel so defeated. I feel so frustrated, right? Like, why are we pushing forward? And I, and I kind of looked at the camera because I'm, I'm in my bathroom. Like, that's my place to do classes, our bathroom, because I feel like there's at least a couple of layers before my kids come breaking in. And as I've said every week, there's a really good chance that one of my kids is going to come through that door right there. So if it happens, don't be alarmed. I, I'm totally used to that. It'll be fine. But, you know, I'm in my bathroom and I'm like, yeah, this isn't normal. But here's what I want the class of 2020 to know. One of the reasons why, and one of the many reasons, I'm so thankful we've been able to do what we've been able to do during these past eight or nine weeks. Uh, just technology-wise, class-wise, keep pushing forward, keep learning, keep talking about Jesus. So thankful for that. But one of the reasons I think, Class of 2020, that we've been doing what we've been doing is because you've been an encouragement to me. Because I've watched you guys navigate what is very difficult. And many of you who loved Jesus before love Jesus even more now in the trial. And for me and my heart, that is just a reminder that this gospel thing that we talk about is real. That this gospel thing that I'll get up in sparks and welcome to chapel, right? Like, and we, I try to get you excited about, you're actually getting me excited about it. And I want you to know that. I want you to hear me say thank you. I want you to hear me say that that's another reason why this kind of last chapel before you finish up with classes uh, tomorrow is so tough for me is because you guys mean the world to me. And I want you to hear me say it as I put this up on the screen behind me. I'm going to miss you next year. I know this isn't like goodbye, goodbye. I fully expect to hear from many of you. Um, but I'm going to miss you next year. And I'm thankful for what uh, the time, the energy, the effort, uh, the stewardship of your time at Briarcrest. You've truly made our school a better place. And you've made me a better person. And so I thank you for that. Now, let me kind of switch gears a little bit and share with you what I want to talk about today. Um, I want to direct what I'm talking about to the class of 2020, but I want you to see for everybody that there's application here. So if you're like, well, I'm not a senior, why am I watching? I, I can promise you there's application here, okay? So follow with me just for a second. But um, I can remember growing up, and I wrote this in a Devo, so if you get my Devos, 
Uh, I've been writing devotionals. And if you want to get a devotional from me, I write them a couple times a week. Send me an email. I'll send it to you. But um, the thing is, with, with me growing up, my favorite movie was Apollo 13. And I know some of you are like, what? <laughs> Your favorite movie was Apollo 13? You're like, my favorite movie was Cars. My favorite movie was High School Musical. Your favorite movie was Apollo 13? Yeah, that, that probably explains a lot about me. I, side note, really wanted to be an astronaut for a really long time. Uh, thought that would have been a lot of fun. Uh, but I get motion sick. If I spun around three times right now, I'd probably throw up. Nobody wants to see that, so I'm not going to do that. And in fact, we went to a water park over spring break before they shut down the world, like a week before they shut down the world. And I went down this water slide backwards and had to lay down for the rest of the night. I was like, I don't feel good. So being an astronaut wasn't going to work for me. But nevertheless, love the movie Apollo 13. And there's this theme in the movie. If you're not familiar with the true story behind the movie, uh, there, there, what happens is this is one of those missions, the Apollo missions to the moon. And they get about halfway to the moon or two-thirds to the moon and something goes horribly wrong. One of their oxygen tanks explodes like a quarter of a million miles away from Earth. Not a great place for your spaceship to break down. So then what they end up doing is slingshotting them around the moon and trying their best to get them home and kind of limp them home uh, because half of their systems have gone haywire. And that's the whole theme of the movie is trying to get home. It's these three guys who are trying to go to the moon and they have to abort their moon landing and they end up coming home and they just want to get home. Now there's a quote in this movie uh, that I want to kind of share with you guys real quick. And this is Jim Lovell. He, Tom Hanks plays Jim Lovell in the movie. Tom Hanks is like this great American treasure that we have. He just plays every hero known to man. Like if there is a hero in the COVID-19 craziness, Tom Hanks will play uh, that hero once they make a movie about this. But I want to share with you this quote. I'm going to read it for you. It says this. This is him. Jim Lovell, the actual commander of Apollo 13, said this. And I'm such a nerd, I read the book too. But this is, this is in the book. This is what it says. He says, I remember this one time. I'm in a banshee at night in combat conditions, so there's no running lights on the carrier. He's talking about a time he was scared. He was talking about a time where he didn't know if he was going to make it back. It was the Shangri-La, and we were in the Sea of Japan, and my radar jammed, and my homing signal was gone because someone in Japan was actually using the same frequency. So it was leading me away from where I'm supposed to be. I'm looking down at a big black ocean, so I flip on my map light and suddenly zap. Everything shorts out right there in my cockpit. The quote continues, all my instruments are gone, my lights are gone, and I can't even tell what my altitude is. I know I'm running out of fuel, so I'm thinking about ditching in the ocean. And I look down there, and in the darkness, there's this green trail that looks like a long carpet just laid out beneath me. It was the algae, right? It was that phosphorescent stuff that gets churned up in the wake of a big ship, and it was just leading me home. If my cockpit lights hadn't, hadn't shortened out, there's no way I'd ever been able to see that. So look at this. You never know what events are going to transpire to get you home. You never know what events are going to transpire. Let me say it one more time. You never know what events are going to transpire to get you home. I remember going to college, and that's kind of where you guys are right now, class of 2020. You're, you're, you're fixing to go to college. You're, you're what, 24 hours away from being done with, with classes? Um, I remember being in those shoes, and listen, I was petrified. Like, I, I wasn't even, like, scared. It was beyond, I didn't, I didn't want to go. I, I, I'd gone to Briarcrest in second grade, class of 2005, so it was about 15 years ago. And by about, I mean it was 15 years ago. And I just didn't want to go. I'm just... And I remember getting to Clemson. Love Clemson. Y'all know that? I wear the tie almost every week. Love Clemson. I'm going to tell every one of you that you should yo, go ahead and send a transcript to Clemson. You never know what the Lord might tell you over the summer. But I can, I can remember getting to Clemson and loving it. My extroverted self just went wild. If you've ever played a pinball machine and you see the ball bounce back and forth in, in the pinball machine, that was me at Clemson. There was just people everywhere. Loved it, right? But even in that, I had this lonely, homesick feeling. And even though I was loving life and getting to have all sorts of amazing experiences and times and meet all sorts of awesome people and grow in the Lord, as I'll share a little bit later, I experienced loneliness and I experienced homesickness. And I want you to keep that in mind as we talk about the events that will transpire to bring you home. Because I think what's interesting about this right now, see, class of 2020, you have a different vantage point than normal. What I mean by that is, You've just spent the last eight weeks at home. So 
probably the last place you want to be is home. If I'm, I'm just guessing. I mean, you're probably like, All right, I'm ready to get out of here. I'm ready to break out of this place. Let, let's go somewhere. But I can guarantee you that many of you, when you get to school, you're not going to tell your, your parents this. Even if you're sitting right by him, you're going to pretend like, uh, I don't, he, he's not talking about me. I'm not going to miss you at all, right? Like, you're going to miss your parents. You're going to miss those siblings that drove you crazy. You're going to miss the sights, the sounds, and the smells of home. You know, I, I one time heard this. I heard somebody say that, you know, the older you get, the less you remember, like, specific memories about home. But you'll never forget the way that home feels. And so homesickness and loneliness, it's to be expected. You are normal. And good luck, right? Yeah, let me pray and be done. I'm kidding. Right, that would be a little bit of a downer to say, hey, I experienced homesickness, you will too. I experienced loneliness, you will too. All right, good luck. I'm out. Camera off, right? Like, that's not helpful. But what is helpful is the gospel. Because the world can identify loneliness and the world can identify a homesickness. The world can tell you all those things are normal. But it's the power of the gospel that helps us understand how we are to navigate those things. So I want to take us to scripture. We're going to go Luke 17, and we're going to stick with the theme that I covered a couple weeks ago uh, of leprosy. Now, you might remember that. We studied that uh, in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1, verses 39 through 43, one of my favorite stories where the, the leper comes to Jesus, and um, when the leper comes to Jesus, Jesus reaches out and touches the man. Um, he's healed. Jesus enters into your loneliness as you're sitting there right now um, feeling lonely and feeling like nobody cares because people are reaching out, right? Like, I get it. I'm there. I felt that last night. There was a sense of loneliness that welled up in me, right? I'm there. I get it. I'm with you. We studied that. You can actually go back on the YouTube channel, which is a nice reason to subscribe. You can go back and watch that video. So I'm not going to cover that extensively. But what I am going to show us, I'm going to show us three points, all right? Because it helps me keep my thoughts in line. Because if, if I don't have three points, this is going to last an hour and 25 minutes. And Luke Hall is going to be texting me and be like, dude, you need to wrap it up. So to avoid that, we're going three points. And here's your first point. This one. Jesus as the means. Jesus as the means. Um, now, we got to understand what is happening in the story. But I'm going to show you in the story that there's a bunch of guys in this story that are just using Jesus as a means to the end. Okay? Let me show you again. Jesus as the means to an end. All right. Watch. Luke 17, 11 through 14, says this, On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. He was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers, keep that in mind, ten of them, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. So as they went... They were cleansed. Now, I want you to keep this verse in mind as we remember what our point is. This is our point, right? Jesus as the means. Okay, I might have shared this story with you. I might not have. And maybe if I shared it, you were asleep. So it might sound like the first time you've ever heard it. So we're all going to be, we're, we're kind of, we're going to get through this together. Now, I remember St. Louis, um, my senior year of college, we took a mission trip with FCA. And this was a very unique mission trip every single year. It was student-led. And we usually had about 300 students that went on it. So we rented like 25, 14 passenger vans. I was one of the van drivers. So they kind of broke us down into groups uh, by van and sent us to different locations throughout the city to serve. So I'm driving this big old 14 passenger van. We caravaned down there with a bunch of us with CB radios. And it was really funny because we'd be driving down the interstate, not speeding, but just driving down the interstate. And then we'd get on the CB and say one, two, three, switch. And we'd all switch lanes together. And it looked like synchronized swimming on the interstate. That was just something that was entertaining to me. But... I remember one of the nights that we were there, the guy that was speaking, and you probably heard me say this, if you're in my class, I know you've heard me say this, but the guy that was speaking was sharing a story, and he was talking about how we as people on mission trips, what we're doing oftentimes, and let's be honest to it with ourselves, like, it's okay, like, let's be honest, um, what we're doing so often is we're making much of us making much of Jesus. Making much of us making much of Jesus. So it's kind of like you went on the mission trip, not to serve the people, but to get a selfie with them. So then you could post the selfie, and everybody would know you're the type of person that goes on a mission trip to serve those people. So you're making much of you, making much of Jesus. And I'm telling you, the reason that many of you have probably heard me share that story, and the reason that many of you have heard me say the phrase, making much of you, making much of Jesus, in fact, let me, hey, let me, let me lay my heart bare before you right now. I'm making much of me, making much of Jesus right now. 
Like there is my in, internally there is this angst between I really want to glorify God and I really want to glorify myself. Right? I can feel that tension happening right now as I'm staring into a camera in my hopefully empty game room unless a kid has come around this corner. So that's kind of where I am right now. I'm, I'm with you. So I'm not talking down to you. I'm still struggling with this, you know, 11 years after I heard that phrase for the first time. But that's what happens when Jesus becomes a means to an end. And it's not wrong that these 10, 10 guys wanted healing. Like, I think that's a good thing that they wanted healing. And I think it's amazing that Jesus healed them. But what ended up happening is that they began to see through their actions, through the fruit in their life, that Jesus was not what they actually wanted. They just wanted something from Jesus. And when they got that thing from Jesus, Jesus no longer had uh, utility. He no longer had purpose. He no longer you know, served that purpose in their life. And so they were just like, great, thanks, Jesus. Deuces, I'm out. And then they left. Watch this. Watch what happens. Let's keep reading. One of them, when he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. We're going to come back to that in a minute. That's huge. Now, he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Were not ten cleansed? Where were the other nine? Now, one of the things that I've tried to encourage us with throughout this entire like online chapel process is that, and I meant, this is what I mentioned at the very beginning, class of 2020, right? Like, this was my encouragement to you. And this is my encouragement to everybody. If you're in the midst of um, a global pandemic where you feel like you're losing a lot of things that are valuable to you and you don't have the answers why and you still feel yourself shaking your fists at the heavens but at the same time wrapping your arms around your heavenly father and you still want Jesus in the midst of the tears and in the midst of the unexplainable situations, that's a great indication that you actually want Jesus. And then while you still struggle, like I do, with making Jesus a means to an end, at the end of the day, when all things are stripped from you, you still want Jesus, and that's good news. But there's some of you, and I know I just talked really fast, but I'm trying to get to my point. There's some of you out there. There's some of you that, that, that would consider yourself uh, a strong Christian. Uh, there's some of you out there that would, um, that we, like, if we looked at your life, we would see somebody doing a lot of serving and, and giving of themselves. You're, you're checking all the boxes. But when push comes to shove, when nobody's looking, and when nobody seems to notice, or even maybe fast forward six months and you're at college and nobody's making you go to chapel, or making you get up for church, or making you go to Bible study, what you're realizing is that you really don't want Jesus. And listen, I'm praying that in that moment when you realize that, you would run to him and you would see that's where life is found. And I'm going to talk about why that's important in a minute, but I want to allow you to do a little bit of self-diagnosis. Because if you're saying right now, I want Jesus, man, great. Praise God that's the case. I'm so thankful for that. And in fact, if you're watching online chapel right now because you want to, that's a good indication that you want Jesus, right? Like that's probably, at least you're curious, right? And that's not to say if you're not watching, right? And I'm not saying that. But the thing that we've got to keep in mind is if we find ourselves using Jesus as a means to an end, We need to repent of that, and we need to see the beauty that is inherent with Jesus, which this guy right over here, I cleared out the slide, sorry, which this guy right here saw. Brings me to point number two, which is this. Jesus as the end himself. Jesus as the end himself. Now, this is what gets really interesting, and I've shared this before, but I think it bears repeating right now. When I went to college, um, when I, when I kind of had my moment like the class of 2020 is having right now, 15 years ago, I was convinced that I was going to get to college and do the stereotypical college thing. And not that everybody goes to college does the stereotypical college thing. It's just the college stereotypes. That's what I was thinking. That's what's going to end up happening. And so I, I, I just was certain that was going to happen. But God did something amazing in my life. God did something amazing in my life in that I began to see I really actually wanted Jesus, not because Briarcrest told me to go to chapel, not because my parents told me to go to church, and not because all my friends claimed to be Christians. The reason that I wanted to go to chapel, I'm not to chapel, the reason that I wanted to follow Jesus was because I really and truly wanted Jesus. It's because I really and truly wanted Jesus. And something inside of me, that just happened. Now let me kind of give you what, let me... For those of you that that's happening right now, let me explain what God's doing inside of you. Watch this. Now, we've already read 
through verse 15 to 17. I just wanted to put them back up here. Look at verse 18. Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Except this foreigner? All right. I want you to think about something for a second. Remember earlier, we talked about wanting to go home. We talked about wanting to, to get back to uh, home, right? Like Jim Lovell, Apollo 13, Tom Hanks, American Hero. I should ring a bell. That's why this word foreigner should stand out right here. So the dynamic that Jesus is, is showing us in this story is it's, it's presumed, I think rightfully so, nine of those guys were Jewish. One of those was Samaritan. The nine Jewish people viewed Jesus as the means to an end, but then you have the Samaritan coming back, who was the outsider. If you know anything about these stories, when you see this, right, like this, this word right here that says Samaritan was supposed to stand out to you, and you were supposed to go, wait, what? Right, because the Jewish, were, Jewish people were religious insiders. The Samaritans were religious outsiders. The Jewish people, let me say it again, were religious insiders. The Samaritans were religious outsiders. And you know why? Let me just be, this is me kind of being vulnerable before you. Um, let me just share with you why I was assuming that when I went to college, I would just be stereotypical college student, right? This was because all throughout high school, for whatever reason, and I'm not blaming anybody for this. I think it was just my own internal struggle. I felt like the, quote, religious outsider. I didn't feel like I was a member of the God Squad. I was keenly aware that I was a sinner. I was keenly aware that I didn't deserve God's grace. And I really struggled if God could love somebody as broken as me. And I always felt like a religious outsider. And I always felt like I didn't deserve it. And I always felt like a far foreigner. And I always felt like this Samaritan probably felt. And I always felt like maybe many of you feel right now. Maybe it's your, your kind of background story, secret sin struggle, um, the fact that you don't feel like you fit in anywhere, you feel like a foreigner, you feel like an outsider. But one of the, one of the most beautiful things I get to see, and it happens all the time, and I don't have permission to share any of the story, so I'm going to be intentionally vague here, but there are people that I've, I've gotten to minister to, minister alongside of, that when they're in high school, they look like the, the, the outsider, if you will, and they're the ones who are treasuring Jesus today. I mean, I'm thinking of very recent conversations and things that I've read that people have sent me, right, that I'm just like, that's God. That's God doing a mighty work in somebody's heart, right? I can think, and so listen, if you feel like the outsider, I want you to see Jesus right here, and I'll throw, throw this back up on the screen. I want you to see Jesus welcoming the foreigner into his presence. As I'm saying, welcoming the foreigner home. Which brings me to my third point. This is my last point. You're hanging in there. You're doing great. Number three. Jesus brought this man home. Jesus brought this man home. Home. It's, it's really interesting. I'm talking about being home, and I'm literally in my home, but that's neither here nor there. Um, a couple years ago, when I went to Ecuador for the first time, I didn't know what to expect. Um, I was going on the trip. I, I wanted to go on the trip. Um, I knew everybody who went on the trip came back and loved the trip loved the experience and experienced the Lord and got to see God do amazing things. And I would encourage all of you who were signed up for the Ecuador trip this year uh, to sign up again and go next year because we are totally planning and on board for another trip next year, Lord willing, if we can make it happen. Um, and so, but this was my first time going, so I didn't know what to expect. And a part of me, if I'm being honest, a part of me like, um, I didn't want to leave home. It wasn't I didn't want to go on the trip because I did. I knew the trip would be great. I heard enough people tell me how great the trip was that I knew the trip was going to be great. But there was a part of me that just, uh, my wife was pregnant at the time. I had three small kids and we were in the process of moving, right? So there was a lot going on at home. And so I had already started feeling a homesickness before I even left home. Let me say that again. I had already started feeling homesickness before I left home. So anyway, I'm in my parents' driveway cleaning my mom's car because that's what that's I just have this weird hobby. I love cleaning cars. They drive better when they're clean. And no, I'm not interested in cleaning your car. Uh, well, maybe it depends on you know if you've got some sort of like super awesome car that you've modified and it, it'll you know do zero to sixty in two point eight seconds. We can talk. But nevertheless, I remember being in my parents' driveway cleaning my mom's car, thinking about this and being like, man, I don't really want to leave home. I mean, I'm excited about going, but I'm still already feeling homesick. And I was listening to a sermon, had no idea what the sermon was about. It was just kind of next up in the queue of things I was going to listen to. And this guy starts talking about home. And I'm like, huh, right? How interesting. 
here's what he shared. And I've never forgotten this. This is why I'm sharing it a couple years later. He shared that even though, you know, if you're Apollo 13, gym level in the spacecraft, craft, like, even though that doesn't feel like home, sometimes this world doesn't feel like home either, does it? Sometimes you can literally be sitting in your home and still, still feel homesick. You can be sitting in your home and still feel lonely. And you know what that is? That's our hearts longing for our true home. And that's why it's so important right here that we take note of the fact that Jesus is talking to a foreigner. And so with that in mind, let me read you verse 18. This is going to show us what we're looking for. Was no one found to return and give praise to God except to this foreigner? Right? So we saw that. And then Jesus says this. He said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Made you well, the way that we've translated this, not to get too nerdy or technical here, the Greek means your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. And so when we see someone, listen to me, if you are simply using Jesus as a means to an end, you'll never get rid of the homesick feeling. You'll always feel like something's missing. You'll always feel like something's amiss. You'll always feel like there's a misfire in your soul. And the way I know that is because you might be feeling homesick and you're still at home, right? Like you can actually testify to that right now on your couch while you're staring at your phone. But if you come to Jesus as the end in and of himself, as the thing you truly want, he'll bring you home. And some of you are like, okay, that doesn't say that. Oh, but it implies it. And I want to show you somewhere where Jesus explicitly says it. If you go over to John chapter 14, what you'll see in John chapter 14 is Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples right before they crucify him. And so this is the Last Supper, because it's the Last Supper. And Jesus is talking to these guys at the Last Supper, and he kind of starts talking about his father's house. There being many rooms. It's a big, big house with lots and lots of rooms. Okay, sorry, I'm a child of the mid-90s, and none of y'all understood. Teachers that are watching and parents that are watching, you might have gotten that. I'm not going to keep going, though. But I want to read to you what Jesus says right here in uh, John 14, 2 through 5. Let's read. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. House, home, there's our theme. If it were not so, would I, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. Jesus will bring us home. Do you see that? Okay. And you know the way to where I'm going. Now, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that asks questions. Whenever my wife and I are trying to have a conversation with somebody else about something really important, she wants me to talk because I'm just going to blast people with questions. I'm like, what about this? And what about that? And what do you think about this? And how do we navigate that? And what if this happens, right? So I can get Thomas right now. I'm kind of resonating with what Thomas is about to do. Because Thomas says, looks at him and goes, because Jesus just said, you know the way to where I'm going. To his father's house. I'm, if I'm Thomas, I'm like, uh, Lord, we don't, we don't know where you're going. <laughs> how, do, how do we get there? What are you talking about? You're, you're talking in Morse code here. I don't understand. I can't, I, I, I'm not tracking with you, Jesus. Look at what Jesus says. It's a, it's a famous verse, and maybe you've never seen the context around it. Look at what Jesus says. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. Do you hear that? No one comes to the Father except through me. And no, no one comes to the Father except through me. I want you to take a second right now and think about these verses because I want you to realize that when Jesus shifts, and because if you grew up in the briar bubble, as I call it, there's going to be a day where like Jesus hopefully shifts your heart from being a means to an end to him becoming the end in himself. And in that moment, he begins the process of bringing you home. Of bringing you home the arms of your Heavenly Father the embrace of your big bro brother Jesus the love that you were supposed to experience all of your life found in God and listen what you're experiencing right now when you can kind of experience that love this side of eternity because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you 
will only be magnified on the day when he splits the sky open, he comes back, and he makes all things new. Let me end with one more story and we'll be done. Um, I remember, and I'm kind of sticking with this um, theme of college, if you will, to end this. Uh, and I might have shared this. I don't know. Um, so if I haven't, you've heard it. Sorry. But I remember the night before I went to college. It was a, it was a weird night. I mean, I remember my dad. My, we all my friends came over to my parents' house because that's like just my parents' house was the hangout place in, in high school for like 15 of us. So my par- my my parents came over to my I mean my friends came over to my parents' house and we're all just sitting around because most of us were leaving for college the next day and we're all just in this place where we're just like moping around. My dad walks in and he's like he's like you know who died like it feels like a funeral like in here like what's what's wrong with y'all? We were all just so sad, already feeling homesick. We hadn't even left home yet. And then, then I remember I was so frustrated and so short-tempered. Uh, I yelled at my younger brother. My younger brother, who's also stronger than me, picks me up, puts me on his shoulders, and starts twirling me around and around. And I hear my dad then come in the room and say, Put your older brother on the ground! The whole twirl! Like, this is just, oh my gosh, that night. I don't know why, but I can vividly remember all of those events. But I remember earlier in the evening, a neighbor friend of ours came by and gave me a Clemson pennant. It was one of these like, little flags, and attached to the back of it was a letter, a handwritten letter that he'd taken the time to write. And so that night, after everybody left my house, I'm super sad about leaving and all this stuff, da 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 and I, and I go, and I'm like, you know, sitting there, and I'm like, oh, yeah, so-and-so brought that letter by. And I wish I still had the letter. I still have the pen, but I don't, I'm not sure where I put the letter. But I remember sitting in my room the night before I went to college, opening that, that long piece of paper and pulling out the handwritten letter. I don't remember exactly what it said. But it essentially said something to the effects of, let me, let me read it to you, um, that he believed God had big plans for me, was going to change my life at college, and he didn't quite use these words, but that he was ultimately going to bring me home. And listen to me, class of 2020, the reason that I can stand here and tell each one of you this is because God answered that prayer. I'm not perfect. I see myself as more screwed up than I've ever seen myself. But there is a good, good father who sent his son Jesus, as John 14, 2 through 6 says, to bring you home. And when I look at this picture, my prayer for each one of you is that God would use the next four years. I don't, I don't care where you are right now. I don't care if you're on fire for him or you are like on a, a, a road crusade to prove that God doesn't exist. I don't care. Or if you're somewhere in the middle, I don't care. My prayer for each one of you is that God would use the next four years to bring you home, finding home in his arms. Let me pray for you guys. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that 15 years ago you answered a neighbor's prayer and you were willing to use my college years to bring me to a place where I was falling more and more in love with Jesus, not because I'm awesome, but because you are. And Lord, right behind me there are 146, I believe, seniors that are about to embark on the same journey. God, my, um, my prayer for them is the same prayer that that man prayed for me 15 years ago that you would do such a mighty work in them. Lord, some of them don't even realize you've started working on their hearts yet. Some of them, if we looked at them right now, and if you asked them right now, they would say they are apathetic at best to the things of you. But in a year, two years, five years down the road, maybe our paths cross, and we see, God, that you have done a mighty work in them. God, would you remind them of what we see in John 14? Would you remind them of of what we saw in Luke 17 where the foreigner was rescued, the foreigner was adopted and saved and made well and brought into the family of God? God, would you see that um, we live in such a place where we need you to bring us home? Would you remind us right now of what you did on the cross to bring us home? that the gospel is that we were alienated from our home because of our sin, just like the Israelites kept getting kicked out of their home because they rebelled, as Mr. Sullivan shared last week. 
We talked about them going into the promised land, and God, we can read the entire Old Testament and see them leaving and coming back and people threatening the land because of their sins. God, because of our sin, we, we've been kicked out of home. But Jesus willingly left his home, came to earth to rescue us and to bring us home. Lord, with the people listening on the other end of this live YouTube stream, would they realize that, that is true for them in Christ, that they are loved that much, and then in the moments of loneliness, not just in college, but right now, in the moments of isolation, not just in college, but right now, and even in the moments of homesickness, when we're in our homes, would you remind us that you've gone to prepare a place for us, and you're going to come back and take us with you. If it were not true, you would not have told us. And you are the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus, thank you for leaving home to come and get us, to bring us home. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us, and especially our class of 2020. I really, really, really meant everything I said. I love you guys. Uh, you're going to be missed, and I expect uh, to stay in touch with many of you. If there's ever anything we can do, please let us know. And once again, this isn't goodbye. This is more just I'll see you later. I'm about to sign off. But by one way, one thing I want to remind you before we sign off, we'd love for you to, to like this page, subscribe to this page, and also you can check out and subscribe to our podcast because we're going to be dropping our next episode with the Matt Schroeder. Uh, that should be dropping later this week. And if you subscribe, you won't miss it. Links should be right below this video. Praying for everybody. And I sincerely, as I've said repeatedly when we're signing this thing off, I sincerely hope to see all of you soon.